Uh, as you know, Manfred is the chairman of the Board of Fellows of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Uh, Manfred is the chairman of the Board of the Fellows of the Jerusalem Center for, for Public Affairs. He is an international business strategist who has been a consultant to governments, international agencies, and the boards of most of some of the world's largest corporations. Amongst his 11 books are Europe's Crumbling Myths, The Post-Holocaust Origins of Today's Anti-Semitism, and most recently, European-Israeli Relations Between Confusion and Change. His next book to be published this year is Academics Against Israel and the Jews. Without further ado, I hand it over to Manfred. Thank you, Edward. Good morning, everybody. Uh, in the year 2000, much publicity was given to the trial. Uh, the British Holocaust denier, David Irving, wrote against the American Jewish historian Deborah Lipstadt in London. The judge in that trial, Charles Gray, in his judgment described Irving as an anti-Semite who had, and I quote, for his own ideological reasons, persistently and deliberately misrepresented and manipulated historical evidence, end of quote. So we all thought that the condemnation of Irving was a definitive victory against Holocaust denial. Denial had been an issue promoted for over 50 years by a variety of extremely marginal figures in Western society. And now we thought it has been discredited definitely. But it is, denial is like the protocols of the elders of Zion, which were twice condemned in court before the Second World War, Switzerland and in South Africa, but it is all the time coming back. <coughs> Worse, Holocaust denial today is a secondary issue among the many manipulations of Holocaust history and memory, because we have moved to a much worse situation. With the statements of Ahmadinejad, we have returned to the world of Hitler and Mein Kampf, the universe of Holocaust promotion. To this is added the word of Holocaust in version, accusing the Jews of being the new Nazis. In this presentation, I'll focus on the three main stages of Iran's recent manipulation of the Holocaust. I want to make clear that my expertise is obviously much more with Holocaust it's my own one, I think. <laughs> uh, that Holocaust um, <coughs> manipulation uh, is much more of my expertise than Iran. I have visited the country very frequently, but my last visit there was for obvious reasons more than 30 years ago. Now let's start with the chronology. Uh, you see it on the slide. He is elected in, uh, Ahmadine, Ahmadinejad <coughs> is elected in June 2005. The first genocidal calls he makes against Israel uh, in October 2005. Uh, he, there is a conference for Al-Quds Day, Jerusalem Day, when the millions march in Tehran against Israel. And he organizes a conference, The World Without Zionism, at the Interior Ministry in Tehran. And on 26 October, he quotes there Imam Khomeini, who had said, quote, this regime that is occupying Quds, Jerusalem, must be eliminated from the pages of history, end of quote. And that's, uh, tell my Iranian friends, a typical expression for Israel's uh, destruction, because they don't mention Israel and uh, they don't speak explicitly about genocide. It's, in other words, it's an Iranian mode of Holocaust promotion. Now, Ahmadinejad repeats these genocidal calls on many later occasions in more or less similar terms because he doesn't have very great variations. And what does the West do? It essentially condemns it uh, or gives a few words. Now, these statements by Ahmadinejad are a public incitement to genocide, and thus they contravene international law. The Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide of 1951 defines it. It stipulates that certain acts which are related to genocide are punishable. And one of these prohibited acts is incitement 
to commit genocide. You don't have to do it. You only have to incite it in order to commit a criminal act. And thus the prosecutor doesn't have to prove that you have committed genocide. He only has to prove that you have incited to, uh, to do it. And my colleague Dora Gold here, the president of the JCPA, is trying with others to bring Ahmadinejad before an international court because of this. Now, back to Iran and its direct Holocaust manipulation. <coughs> it has had, in the past 14 months, 15 months, three components. The first one is Ahmadinejad and his collaborators have denied the Holocaust. The second was the competition by the Hamashari daily, daily, and the third one was the, we call the Holocaust Deniers Conference, was really a Holocaust denial and minimization conference in Tehran in December 2006. And these are the three prime components of uh, the Iranian attitude towards the Holocaust. The direct Holocaust denial starts in December 2005. Ahmadinejad comes to Mecca. There is there a conference of the 57 members of the Organization of the Islamic Conference. And this meeting is being called an extraordinary meeting in order to show the world that Muslims want to fight against the sentiments of hatred toward Islam by showing how moderate Muslims are. Uh, however, in the margins of that conference, Ahmadinejad uh, holds a press conference and he says there, I quote, certain European countries insist on saying that Hitler has killed millions of Jews in gas chambers. They go so far as to say that whoever states the contrary must be condemned and thrown into prison. Ahmadinejad, and of course Ahmadinejad, then claims that the Holocaust has not occurred. He says, in the, I quote, we do not believe this assertion. But even if it were true, we ask the Jews, the Europeans, the following question. Is the murder of innocent Jews by Hitler the reason for the support of the occupiers of Jerusalem? And of course, that he adds, quote, the Europeans should offer part of their territory from Germany, Austria, other countries, so that the Jews can install their state there and forth. Now, these words on Holocaust denial spark many negative reactions in the West. All talk again, nothing else, like on the genocidal threats. And certain people, such as the Austrian Chancellor Wolfgang Schüssel, he doesn't even understand the Iranian president's intentions. He says Ahmadinejad's remarks are, quote, an incident, or an incredible derailment. And he mentions that Holocaust denial is a crime in Austria. Ahmadinejad is not much discouraged by all these beautiful Western declarations. And on the 13th December, he repeats his Holocaust denial, he speaks in Zardan, in southeastern Iran, and he adds a few new lines, the only new lines we have seen from him since then, the rest is all the petition. The Europeans inverted comma, created a myth in the name of the Holocaust, and they value that higher than God, religion, and the prophets, end of quote. These words are then broadcast on Iranian television, and since then he and a variety of officials of, uh, of Iran uh, have expressed a variety of variations on this same core motif. Now there is one very surprising reaction to this, and it comes from the head of the Iranian Jewish community. Uh, which is regularly misquoted. This man, Harun Yishayai, writes a letter to Ahmadinejad. He said that the small community of Iranian Jews is horrified by the Iranian public media's daily denial of Nazi Germany's genocide of the Jews. Yishayai, he doesn't mention Ahmadinejad's own Holocaust denial. And in the letter, he also manipulates the Holocaust by himself because he says, quote, it's true that the Zionists have been exploiting the Holocaust to pose as victims, and there is historic evidence about some radical Zionist groups collaborating with the fascists and the Nazis to intensify the Holocaust, end of quote. That's the chairman of the Iranian Jewish community. He, makes, uh, he calls uh, Sharon the Butcher, and so on. This tone of the letter and the orientation of his protest toward the media and not toward Ahmadinejad mixed with these attacks on Israel that reflects, uh, as we all understand, the reality of the Jewish condition in Iran, even if people tell me that Yeshaya is a former communist. 
<coughs> so then comes in January an announcement which is not followed up. The Iranian government announces that it intends to hold an international conference on the Holocaust. It, it, this is, however, delayed for many months, and it only comes, to, uh, comes into reality at the end of December of last year. So this were, was the first step, Ahmadinejad's Holocaust denial comments, followed by others. Then comes the second, the second major Iranian outburst concerning the Holocaust, and that is the uh, cartoon competition, Hamashari, which doesn't belong to Ahmadinejad, belongs to the Tehran municipality. It's also does a government, local government journal. It uh, calls for a cartoon competition on the Holocaust because you say, this is after the Mohammed cartoons, the Danish Mohammed cartoons, it says, well, uh, you can say anything about Mohammed apparently in Europe. Let's see what happens if we say is something about the Holocaust. Now, this cartoon competition should have collected a rather random number of cartoons because you ask for concerning the Holocaust, you get a very, should uh, expect a number of cartoons all focused on the Holocaust. However, the interesting thing is that it illustrates all the major anti-Semitic themes, all the major things of anti-Semitism, many of which have no relation whatsoever with the Holocaust, uh, are in there. And a student intern, Hilly Hansen, has analyzed these cartoons, or at least the ones which have been exhibited. 200 cartoons are selected among the 1,100 entries. They come from 60 countries, and it opens in August 2006 in Tehran. Several of these cartoons portray Israel as having taken the place of the Nazis, and the Palestinians are often depicted as suffering Nazi-like, or even worse treatment by the Israelis. Other cartoons convey the message that Israel exploits the Holocaust as a weapon against the Palestinians, or as a tool to get sympathy from the world. And yet, other cartoons indicate that the Holocaust is a hoax, or alternatively, uh, grossly exaggerated. And if you go through these cartoons, as we have done here after Hilly collected them, is you see all the classic anti-Semitic core motifs. First of all, the major core motif, which is the extreme evil of the Jews. The Jews are the worst in the world. And then you get the range of these five, six derivatives, which are deicide, conspiracy theories of world domination, blood libel, infanticide, zoomorphism, and so on. Some even contain, as is also for those who know, have a good view on anti-Semitic cartoons, have more than one motif. So <coughs> others uh, proclaim that Israel doesn't want peace, and yet others attack the West. Now, if you look at all these cartoons, then you sh see one thing on which there is so much great debate, anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism really in a major way overlap. It's very clear, even from the short collection which I'll show. They mingle, the cartoonists mingle supposed Israeli characteristics and supposed Jewish characteristics in their pictures. The characteristics who come from Muslim countries often depict Jews as ultra-Orthodox. Uh, with black hats and side locks. And those from other countries frequently draw Israeli soldiers. But you will also find Israelis, typical Israelis, <coughs> with black hats and side locks, which, of which I don't see that many here in the hall. Many cartoons center on the core, centuries old anti Semitic theme that Jews represent, and now Israel, represent absolute evil. And as said, they cover almost all categories of anti Semitic lies and stereotypes. Now, the great expert on Arab cartoons is a Belgian political scientist, Joel Kotek, we have also published and you can find it on our website. And he says there's this collective image of the Jews created by all these Arab cartoons lays the groundwork for possibility of genocide. But many of these cartoons are not Arab cartoons. They are from non-Arab and non-Muslim countries. Belgium, Brazil, China, Greece, India, Italy, Norway, Poland, Sweden, and the United States. And I've given you only a very limited selections. And many of these cartoonists, by the way, have non-Muslim names. So let's now look at the individual cartoons. Uh, Holocaust inversion, i.e. that the Jews are the new Nazis, is a frequent and extreme anti-Semitic motif. 
And several cartoons in the competition give the message that Israel is perpetrating a holocaust against the Palestinians. But this cartoon, by the Moroccan cartoonist Najib Benaji, <coughs> goes even further by suggesting that the Israelis treat the Palestinians worse than the Germans treated the Jews during the <coughs> Second World War. Because, uh, you see, the one bottle with the Holocaust on the left has a few skulls, but the one with the Palestinians is full of skulls. Uh, and he gets a special prize of the competition for this drawing. A well-known uh, cartoon, uh, anti-Semitic cartoonist is Carlos Latouf. He's not an Arab, he's a Brazilian Zapatist, former Zapatist. And he has been uh, doing these cartoons for many years. You cannot have a collection of anti-Semitic cartoons without having Latouf. And he won in this competition, he won wins a second, a shared second prize in the Tehran competition for what you see, uh, the Holocaust inversion, the Arab as a Holocaust, uh, as a Holocaust uh, prisoner. Uh, the next one is also Holocaust inversion. Algerian, Shukri Beladi, Israeli flag turns into a swastika. The first prize now for uh, this is uh, an Iranian, uh, sorry, this is a Moroccan, another Moroccan, Abdallah Berkai, and he shows a crane placing a wall, this is of course a Holocaust motif, before the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, and here you have really a variety of the narratives, of the false Palestinian uh, narratives. The wall, which is a fence, uh, the Holocaust inversion, and the threat to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, another aspect of the Holocaust is exploitation and denial. One of the, uh, I mean, the 200 of these type of cartoons shown, and another 800, uh, uh, were uh, presented. Uh, this one is what we call Holocaust exploitation. You see, fairly ugly looking uh, Jew who is an Israeli. Uh, you have here the, uh, the, the ultra-Orthodox and the, uh, the Israeli, and he runs a carpet over a bleeding poor Arab woman. Um, now, this is a typical Christian cartoon, one would say, because uh, Jesus is not God's son in the uh, Arab tradition, Muslim tradition. He's only a prophet. This is a Jordanian, a Jihad Artani, who combines two anti-Semitic motifs by drawing a bleeding Arab crucified on a cross made of the letter T from the Holocaust. And there is also another uh, Christian motif, you really have to come out of Christian tradition to understand it was explained to me as well, who you, the Holocaust nail pierces a vein, and apparently in Christian imagery, uh, this idea of piercing a vein is, is, a, is a, recurrent, uh, a recurrent thought. Now now we get to an Indian, and we get to the more classic anti-Semitic uh, uh, themes, this is a man called Sadiq Pala, and he stylizes an ultra-orthodox Jews with, uh, with vampire teeth and the Star of David. So you see here the Jew and the Israelis with each other, the blood, uh, he, uh, the Jew vampire drinks, drinks blood, Palestinian blood. Uh, infanticide. This is Latouf again. Uh, Israelis does a Palestinian child with gasoline. Uh, now we get to the Jew as a subhuman being, uh, as an animal, and this zoomorphism theme is another cartoon of Pala, the Indian. The Jew has vampire teeth next to a vampire bat, and which hangs from a branch. See again, the ultra-orthodox, the Israeli, they mix them, anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism come, to, come together. Now Kotek, who has done a lot of research on Arab cartoons, has shown that Jews are the only people in the history of, car of cartoons which are depicted as vampires. It's a typical way of depicting uh, Jews. 
the certain animal. Uh, if you want to depict an, uh, an, uh, uh, Jews, you choose certain animals, octopus, the, guy, the person who controls the world, the snake. Even that, I uh, must say, that when we showed, uh, when we published Kotek at the time, there was a snake there of Barak, I believe. And then uh, we got, I got an email from the Jordanian Katubis says, I am not an anti-Semite. I have also once uh, put a PLO figure as a snake. Uh, <laughs> uh, so indeed, good company. Now, the last one I want to show, which is also the last major anti-Semitic motif, of course, the Jews dominate the world. You see there the Jewish boot uh, on the uh, on the world. Uh, or oh, another Yodegi. Uh, now, look, I could show here another 190 from what is on the web, but I'll spare you that. Uh, obviously, as I said, this is not the national government. This is the local government. And that is uh, the local government's paper. And that's very important because you have one guy who starts it, and then it spreads to Iranian society, and it starts spreading internationally. That gets us now to the third major aspect of the Iranian Holocaust distortion system, which is the Holocaust Denial and Minimization Conference. It's called International Conference on Review of the Holocaust Global Edition. Uh, in December in Tehran, who organizes it? The Foreign Office Iranian Institute for Political and International Study, Studies, IPIS. And this is uh, an institute which is internationally recognized. I'll come back on that. Who opens it? the Foreign Minister Manusher Mutaki, and he underlines the is uh, Iranian instrumentalization of the Holocaust, explains the goals of the conference. And Mutaki says, if we question the Holocaust, then that is one more way of attacking the United States, and along with others, such as when we criticize the presence of the United States in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Mutaki also claims that, and I quote, if the official version of the Holocaust is thrown into doubt, then the identity and nature of Israel will be thrown into doubt. End of quote. And, no. and if during this review of the Holocaust it proved that the Holocaust was a historical reality, then what is the reason for the Muslim people of the region and the Palestinians having to pay the cost of the Nazi crimes? End of quote. He conveniently obviously doesn't mention the failed genocidal war of the several Arab states and the Palestinians against Israel in 1948, which uh, is at the, the main uh, origin of the Palestinian situation. <coughs> now, who comes there? It's uh, mainly a bunch of Holocaust deniers, plus a few ultra-Orthodox Jews, extremely ultra-Orthodox Jews. And the Iranian Foreign Ministry calls this uh, motley collection intellectuals and researchers from 30 countries. They hand out literature that describe the Holocaust as one of the most important propaganda tools to politically justify the support for the Jewish people in the 20th century. Now, most of the meetings there at the conference are closed meetings. Ahmadinejad also speaks. One of these Natura Carta people uh, at the beginning says he hopes to have the occasion uh, to meet Ahmadinejad. And he makes, again, a genocidal statement. Quote, just as the Soviet Union was wiped out and today doesn't exist, so the Zionist regime soon will be wiped out. End of quote. Now, there is, uh, they're not happy with only a conference, they, will, they announce immediately a follow-up, and they will now create a new World Foundation for Holocaust Studies. The I Iranian presidential advisor, Mohammed Ali Rami, is appointed as its secretary general. <coughs> this is uh, somebody who has already said about the Jews in May 2006, I quote, throughout history, this religious group has inflicted the most damage on the human race, end of quote. And a few weeks later, he indicated the direction of Holocaust manipulation for this new foundation. will take, because he says Hitler was the son of a Jewish prostitute, and his policies are aimed at establishing a Jewish state. These are all state officials. These are not marginal uh, figures who make uh, a statement somewhere in an, uh, in an extremist uh, Shiite uh, mosque. Now, what happens? What does the West do? Essentially, most of it are condemnations, and I'm not going to repeat those uh, here because uh, there are hundreds of them. There are a few. Uh, the, the main one 
One important one is what the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon says. I quote, denying historical facts, especially on such an important subject as the Holocaust, is just not acceptable, end of quote. Well, they certainly were shocked in Tehran to hear that. But uh, Moon immediately weakens his own condemnation because he adds, whenever and when the situation requires me to do so, I'm prepared to engage in dialogue with the Iranian people. And he leaves open the possibility that he'll visit Tehran. There are some actions. Chirac, the French president, asked the Justice Minister to carry out an investigation of statements made by the French Holocaust uh, denier Faurisson uh, in Tehran. And he also asked the Paris prosecutors uh, whether Faurisson can be prosecuted under a 1999 uh, law making it crime to deny the Holocaust. There's another hopeful reaction is in Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, which is planning an enhanced website that makes available Holocaust information in Farsi, Arabic, Russian, and a couple of other languages. Deborah Lipstadt, who teaches at uh, Emory, says that this will give resources to those who cannot find information on the Holocaust in these languages. But there's one more interesting uh, reaction. After the Tehran conference, 40 European and North American research institutes very prominent research institutes break their relations with IPIS. They will not invite, they, they will not go to any meetings of the institute and they will not invite scholars from there. Then in January, Germany proposes initially that the EU should adopt the uniform law that Holocaust denial would be a criminal offense. Italy adopts some kind of a law which says that uh, it exists already in countries such as Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Poland, and Spain. Uh, since then, we already speak about watering down the law. It's not very clear where it will go, Holocaust denial will not be specifically mentioned. We speak about genocide denial in, uh, in a broader sense. Then, uh, one day before the UN International Day of Commemoration in memory of victims of the Holocaust, 26 January 2007, the UN General Assembly approves a resolution by consensus introduced by the United States. It condemns, without any reservation, any denial of the Holocaust. It doesn't mention any country, by the way. And Iran says, reacts, that the Holocaust should be examined to determine its scope. But we see how the thing is really seeping everywhere, what Ahmadinejad does. Because uh, Venezuela, when it accepts the resolution, says, Israel's excesses, I quote, under the pretext of legitimate defense has led to a new Holocaust against the Palestinian people. End of quote. So we are now uh, with a non-Arab government, a non-Muslim government. We are in Latin America. So you see how it uh, seeps through. What do the media do? Most Western media condemn the conference. The Los Angeles uh, Times discusses in detail the Muslim collaboration with Nazis during the Holocaust in Palestine. To Tunisia and in Bosnia. But there is one medium, a couple of media, who also don't do that. And one of those is the International Herald Tribune. The Herald Tribune gets an article from uh, its uh, Iranian correspondent, Nazila Fati, and she, Tama, ta, I'm quoting Tamar Sternthal of Kamara, who has investigated that, she granted the conference discussion the same legitimacy and credibility as what this journalist terms the accepted version of events surrounding the Nazi genocide side of the Jews. At no point in the article does Fatih state as a fact that millions of Jews were murdered by the Nazis and that those who claim otherwise are liars. Then, by the way, the New York Times, which controls the, uh, the, uh, the Herald Tribune, prints the same article but edits it to put in facts of on the, on the whole. Let's not stand still with that, and let's move to the idea of uh, historical revisionism and Holocaust denial in the Muslim and Arab world in the past. There are many well-known Holoca Arab Holocaust deniers, Muslim Holocaust deniers. In 1964, Gamal Abdel Nasser, then president of Egypt, says to a West German newspaper, he opposes the lie of the six billion. Uh, the Zayed Center in Abu Dhabi, now defunct, associated with the Arab League, held the Holocaust uh, Denial Symposium in Abu Dhabi in 2002. 
Alan Dershowitz has reminded us recently that at the same Zayed Center is a place where the famous humanist Jimmy Carter lectured for a fee. Mohammed Mahdi Akaf, the uh, current leader of Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood, is yet another uh, politician who has denied the Holocaust. But we can stay closer to home. Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, the president of the Palestinian Authority, is a Holocaust denier as well. In 1984, he raises doubts that gas chambers were used to exterminate Jews, and he claims that the number of Jews murdered in the Holocaust might be even less than a million. Abbas also wrote that the Zionists believed in the purity of the Jewish race, as Hitler believed in the purity of the Aryan race, the typical model of Palestinian. Uh, now, as I said, it seeps through. After the Tehran gathering, there is another Holocaust denial conference a few weeks later in Cairo convened by the Arab Socialist Party. <coughs> what were the Muslim reactions? What were Muslim reactions? There weren't that many. But some of these were condemnations, and some Muslim commentators even note the absurdity of a conference in Tehran supposedly promoting freedom of speech on the Holocaust because there is no freedom of expression on so many things in in Iran. You find also the sheikhs of the Islamic movement in Israel condemn it, but they make it a condition that the Jewish rabbi's president at the conference condemn the erection of the Museum of Tolerance in, uh, in Jerusalem on, uh, on a Muslim cemetery. Uh, now, a lot of publicity is given to this Arab Holocaust Museum in Nazareth. Uh, he, uh, this man, uh, Atoni Khaled Mohammed, he wants to attend the conference in Tehran to confront the deniers, he says, and he is denied the visa, he cannot go there. But there is a little snack with the Arab Holocaust Museum in Nazareth. The Anti-Defamation League praises that it exists, but it is very critical of some of the messages of this museum, which is a Holocaust manipulator. The Anti-Defamation League declares that it is deeply concerned that founder and curator